but if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Mark. We're going to read today in Mark's Gospel, Mark chapter 4. And we're going to begin by reading uh, in verse 1 to 9. All right, let's, uh, let's read. Again, he began to teach beside the sea. And a very large crowd gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables. And in his teaching, he said to them, Listen. How many of you know when Jesus says listen, we should listen? (laughs) Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path. And the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up. And since it had no depth of soil, and since it had no depth of soil, and when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil. And produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding 30-fold and 60-fold and 100-fold. And then Jesus said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. The first time that I ever encountered this parable in real life was during my very first few months in ministry. You know, I began as a, a pastor at the very mature and seasoned age of 20 years old. Something I would never, ever, for the life of me, recommend anyone do. But just so happened that that is when the Lord called me. And and by his grace, I'm still here today. But, you know, as a 20-year-old, everything about the ministry was fresh and exciting. You know, I was that young, optimistic uh, person who was just so thrilled by the pulpit and the people and the possibility of, of life change. You know, I had those rose-colored glasses on in terms of how I saw the church and, and life and everything in it. And very early on, I met a man by the name of John. And John was the sort of person why, who I went into the ministry for. You know, he was a, a prodigal son sort of figure. He was the father of one of the girls in, in the youth group that I was pastoring. And, you know, he was a man who struggled with all sorts of addictions and issues. But early on in those first few months, I saw him come to the Lord dramatically. It was was incredible. And I saw that instantly he came to the Lord and his soul was on fire. This guy was sold out. He was there every Sunday. He was so on fire for the Lord and it was just so encouraging. I was like, yes, this is what it's all about. But then I saw that the fire in him only lasted a few weeks. And before I knew it, the, the, the man who kind of came to the Lord so quick, so on fire, as quickly as it came, it went. And it wasn't long before, you know, John was missing on Sundays. And I would call him, and he wouldn't pick up the phone, and you would check in, and he would resist any attempts, you know, to, to see how he was doing. I was lamenting John's sudden departure one day to my lead pastor, who was much older than I was, you know, more seasoned, perhaps maybe a little more jaded. And he shrugged his shoulders at me and he said, well, he's the rocky soil in the parable of the soil, uh, of the sower. And I said, what do you mean? What do you mean he's just the rocky soil in the parable of the sower? And he said, well, some people's hearts are just like that. Quick to respond, but then quick to leave when there's any sort of resistance or temptation comes their way. They fall away because, as Jesus said, there's no depths in their hearts. And with that, he walked away and left my office. And maybe he missed that teaching moment, I don't know, but I'll be honest, I was confused. Perhaps even a little bit mad. Because was there any possibility that the parable that Jesus said of these three soils, that a rocky soil doesn't have to be a rocky soil, that it can become a good soil, and that the thorny soil can become the good soil, or is it just the way it is. Is that what Jesus is saying? Is he describing, you know, people's hearts or is he giving a prescription? Is he calling people to be the good soil? I didn't know. I didn't know. And I was wondering, you know, can people's hearts change or is that just the way it is? You know, why do some hearts say yes to the gospel and others say no? Why is it that, that many start running the race of faith but not all finish the race? 
Why is it that I received the gospel and, you know, stuck with it, so to speak, while many other of my friends who also received the gospel, when I look at them and how they're living, you know, it's evident that they have fallen away. And, you know, this morning, what I want to do today is look at this parable and sort of get to the bottom of what Jesus is saying. Of what he means when he speaks of being the sort of soil that one, on one hand produces a harvest of abundance, while on the other hand, what does it mean to be the sort of soil that squanders the seed? The seed comes into the soil, but it gives no fruit, it bears no fruit. And the parable that we just read in Mark's gospel is, is known as, as I've mentioned, the parable of the sower. And it's found in all three of the synoptic gospels. The synoptic gospels are, are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You know, it's, it's believed that Mark's gospel was the one written first and that Matthew and Luke sort of borrowed heavily from Mark's gospel. But the three of them are known together as the synoptic gospels. And I think the fact that all three of these gospels mention this parable should signal to us that this parable was of great significance to Jesus and the kingdom. You know, later on in verse 13, how this, how this chapter goes is we have Jesus share the parable in a very cryptic way that sort of doesn't explain to anyone. As, as we know, parables are, are not meant to just be explained to those who don't understand. They're supposed to just, just be given out there. And if you, if you have ears to hear, you'll hear. And if you don't, then you, well, you don't. And then sort of in the middle after this, Jesus sort of gives this, this understanding of what parables are about and what is happening, what is, what is going on in these parables. And then later on, he will quietly go back to his disciples and explain to them the meaning of this parable. But in verse 13 of, of Mark chapter 4, Jesus will say, and he said to them, do you not understand this parable? He says to his disciples, And then he says this, really interesting question. How then will you understand all the parables if you don't understand this parable? As if if understanding this parable just might be the key to understanding all the parables of Jesus. You know, for what do we know about parables other than that they are designed to reveal whose hearts are open to God and the kingdom and whose hearts are closed? You know, they're not meant to be explained to those whose hearts are closed. It's not meant to be interpreted. And we know that not everyone's hearing Jesus the same way. Some hear him, they have ears to hear, others don't. And so Jesus is saying one thing, he's saying the same thing, but to you, you hear it one way, you hear it another, you know, and you hear it a different way. And the point is not to explain it to everyone so that we're all on the same page. The point is to let ears, to have ears to hear here, to hear these deeper, deeper truths about God's kingdom. You know, some might even say that these parables are, judge, are Jesus pronouncing judgment on the hearts of, his, of the listeners. You know, there's a judgment being pronounced that if you can't hear it, it's you, you've been judged. That's judgment. And if you hear it, you also have been judged. You know, these, they're key to knowing who is already in their hearts saying yes to God and who in their hearts is already saying no. You know, it's judgment, if you would. And so how do you know who will say yes? How do you know who will say no? And Jesus is telling us here in this parable, look at their hearts and then you'll know who's going to say yes to me and who will say no. If you want to know who will say yes to my kingdom, look no further than the condition of their hearts. And knowing that he would soon be descending his disciples, and you know, we are his disciples, right? And knowing he'd be sending his disciples out into the world to carry the same message in which he brought into the world, he did not want them to go into the world uninformed. And that's why Jesus, you know, explains what this parable means. He does not want them to go unprepared, unexpected of what they might face. When you go out and when you share the gospel, some people are going to reject you. How many of you know, have you ever been rejected because of what you believe, because of what you have to share? Some people are going to even hate you. And some are going to seem that when you bring this message, their heart's going to come alive and it's going to be a blaze, but then they will fall away because, you know, they're persecution or temptation or they realize that hey there's a cost to following Jesus that you know the salvation that you receive is free but there's a cost you know there's sacrifice there's a a cross you got to pick up and bear and to follow Jesus and your job you disciples in which Jesus has disclosed the secrets of the God's kingdom your job is not to sit back on earth and judge sinners hearts 
Your job is to go and win back the hearts of the lost. Will many say no? Absolutely, many will say no. But here's the thing. Here's what's to encourage you. Here's what to excite you and I as disciples. That uh, to those who say yes, there is the potential in their hearts, in your hearts, to produce a harvest of righteousness that will exceed any of your wildest dreams. So what Jesus does then is he gives his disciples the meaning of this parable. And let's read, let's understand what Jesus means when he, he shared this parable of the, of the sower. Verse 14 to 20. Jesus said, the sower sows the word. So right there, this should give us a clue as to who, you know, what does the seed and what does the sower represent. The sower sows the word. And these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear... Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground. The ones who, when they hear the word, you know, the Johns of this world, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution, or Jesus just asks them to take up their cross to follow him, arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones sown among thorns. This is the one that our culture needs to hear very clearly. They are, the, they are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. But those who are sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word, accept it, and most importantly, bear fruit. Thirtyfold, and sixtyfold, and a hundredfold. So let's break this down a little. First, you, you have the sower. Now, the sower is nondescript. We don't know exactly who the sower is because that's beyond the point. On one hand, of course, the sower is God. God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son into the world to bring the message of salvation. Jesus came to spread the good news of the kingdom of God. But on the other hand, the sower also represents anyone and everyone who on behalf of God calls others to repentance. And as, as ambassadors of Christ, you are an ambassador of Christ. Your job here on earth is to implore others to be reconciled to God and be born again. That is what we do as ambassadors. And so in another sense, you and I, we too are sowers who sow the word. And a sower has but one job, that is to sow the seed. The sower does not know what sort of harvest the seed that is sown will, will result, what it will produce. Paul said to the Corinthians that I planted the seed. You know, speaking of the church that was planted in Corinth, I planted you. And then Apollos, another disciple, came along later and he watered the seed. But make no mistake, it's God who gives the growth, Right? I planted Apollos water, but don't be fooled. God gives the growth. And as sowers of God's word, it's not our job to measure fruitfulness, but to measure faithfulness. You know, we cast the seed, and the outcome of what happens when the word of God, the seed, is casted in the hearts of others, the result of that is not up to us. You know, you and I cannot control the hearts of any other person. You know, we can't control, you know, where we're born, you know, what country we're born in. We can't control who our neighbors are. We can't control the people we work with. But at the end of it all, though, God will want an account as to what we did with the seed he provided us. You know, our, our judgment, our account is not going to be what happened in the hearts of those we shared the word, but we will be brought before the Lord and he will, he will ask us the question, you know, did you sow the seed I provided you? Have you sowed my seed? Where? Where? To which? To where? You know, wh where can you show me the seed has been scattered? You know, a sower sows the word. And Jesus says, the, word, the seed is the word of God. The sower sows the word. The seed is the word. It's God's word. It's the gospel. That's the seed. The good news of Jesus Christ in which you once received in your heart. Someone once came and scattered seed into your heart and it was implanted in you and you received it and that seed birthed new life in you. Amen? 
1 Peter 1, 23 says, Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God, in you has been planted an imperishable seed. The word of God is an imperishable seed. It is a seed brimming with new life, with power, with potential. You know, Paul shared in the the book of Romans how he's not ashamed of the gospel. He's not ashamed of God's word, for it is, the, it is the power of God for salvation. God's word as a seed is powerful. And for the seed to become truly powerful and not just potentially powerful, the seed needs to be implanted in the soil. You know, James 1.21 says, Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word of God which is able to save your souls. To produce a harvest of righteousness, every believer needs the word of God planted deep down within you. And it's why we're not to, as believers, just read your Bible once. You know, I've got books on my shelf that I read one time, and they'll sit on my shelf forever and ever, and I'll look at that and be like, that was a good book. <laughs> you know, the Bible, the Word of God, you know, is, is not a book you just read once and sit on yourselves, and somebody says, have you ever read that one? And you're like, oh yeah, yeah, good book, good book, good book. Martin Luther once said, we need to hear the gospel every day. Every day we need to hear the gospel. Why? Because every day we forget it. We forget it every day. Therefore, we need to hear the gospel every day. We must develop a love for God's word because it has the power to change hearts. It's living and active, God's word says, that it has purpose, power, effectiveness through teaching and rebuking and correcting and training. The word of God, the seed which which produces new life, is God-breathed. It carries God's life through the Spirit's. And it has the power to transform a person's heart, to transform your heart, no matter what condition of your heart is that the seed is founded. It has the power. It has the potential. You see, there's nothing wrong with the seed. You know, there are many people today who want to blame the seed. We just need to, or, and, and blame the sower along with that. Let's just blame the sower, blame the seed, and just do away with it. You know, or perhaps we want to genetically modify the seed. You know, to make it a little more less, like to make it less offensive. Less truthy. <laughs> less, uh, more, more open-minded, or to be more culturally relevant. I have an idea. Let's modify the seed of God's word so that when people, when it's sowed, people will be like, yes, that's the sort of seed that I, my heart wants. Now, God's word always needs to be properly interpreted and, and contextualized, of course, of course. But there's nothing wrong with the seed. Sure, the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing. But those being saved, it is the power of God. And so we have the sower, the one who scatters, who casts, who preaches, who proclaims God's word. We have the seed, which of course represents the power of God, the life, the life of God, God's word. And that leaves us then with the soil, which is really what Jesus is getting at. He, he really wants, he's really driving uh, home to the soil. He wants us to see the soil. And if it's not apparent already, the soil, and Matthew's account of this parable really actually explicitly states it, that the soil represents the heart. That the seed gets scattered into different soils as the word of God gets scattered into different hearts. And it is the same seed that goes into that person's heart and that person's heart and that person's heart, that person's heart. But how many of you know that the results will vary? Not because of the seed, but because of the condition that the soil is in. And just like the seed, the soil also carries its own great potential. It's the seed that gives life, but... It's the soil that represents the condition and atmosphere where life can be made possible. You know, when soil is fertile, the seed can produce much fruit. But when the soil is left to itself, nothing's going to grow. 
without seed, nothing's going to grow, or perhaps better said, there's something will grow, <laughs> but it's not going to be the sort of things you want to grow, like weeds. You leave it, you don't plant any grass seed, no grass is going to grow, but weeds are going to grow, they just find a way to grow. So what Jesus is telling us then, there are four different soils that represent four different sort of hearts that, that, that hear God's word, but receive it differently. The first is the seed that's spread on the hardened path, where people walk and the soil has been compacted. It's been pushed down by all that foot traffic. You know, the seed goes there, and, and as soon as it's sown, it's immediately snatched up by the birds because there's nowhere for the seed to go. Since the hard ground leaves no room for the seed, it can't sprout in the first place, and so it's nothing more than bird food. Or, as Jesus says, Satan comes and snatches it up. Who are these sort of people? You know, who do you think Jesus is talking about when he talks about hardened hearts? You know, I, I wonder if the people that we have in mind are a little bit different than the, the people that Jesus had in mind. You know, these are the people who have been hardened by sin, but they're, they might not even know it. They are people with calloused hearts, hardened hearts, and the sort of people that Jesus called as being hardened uh, <laughs> to the truth of God's word were perhaps not the people you have in mind, but the people that God had in mind were the religious folks. The children of Israel throughout the Old Testament, God said, called them, you stiff-necked people. You hard-hearted people with uncircumcised eyes, ears, and hearts. And Jesus brought that same sort of rebuke against the Pharisees, the religious leaders of that day, who hear but don't understand, who say great things with their mouths, but their hearts remain hardened to the truth. You know, when I think of somebody with a hardened heart, I might think of somebody out there, you know, who never goes to church, who, who's an atheist, whose heart's just, oh, I want to just, on a crusade, just sort of prove Christianity wrong. Jesus says, that's not the sort of person. Sure, their hearts can be hardened, don't get me wrong. But the sort of people that I'm pointing to are those who honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They're hard. The word of God cannot give through. And, and church, I believe today that it's, it's, it's easy on one hand to discount those type of people, people with hardened hearts. But we need to pray for them, amen? Like we need to pray for them because how many of you believe today that God can till up the hardest heart? You know, Ezekiel speaks about how God in the, in the days that is prophesied of the days of Christ that I will come and I will remove their hard hearts and I'll put in them a new heart. And a new spirit. How many of you believe your friends, your family, who you know, they have hard hearts? And many times the word of God has come out, but, you know, like the birds have come and snatched it up before you even got a chance. That God can, God can move in those hearts. Do you believe that? Remain as witnesses, as ambassadors, as sowers. Don't stop scattering seed. I, I implore you. I, I, I call on you today. If you've given up, if it's been years since your, your lost neighbors or your brothers or sister, whatever it is whose heart, don't give up. No matter how hard a heart gets, it's never so hard that God can't melt it by his mercy and grace. So let's pray for them. Let's be faithful to scattering the seed. The second is the seed, though, which fell on rocky ground. Which if you thought Ottawa's soil was rocky, <laughs> that's what I always hear. When I had to uh, redo my fence during the storm, which blew it down, I was like, Ottawa's got rocky soil. Ah, yeah, oh, and I learned that lesson, having to like move the hole three times over because of these rocks. But just take a trip over to Israel, would you? And then you'll really see what hardened, rocky, stony soil looks like. This, so, this, is a, there, this soil, Jesus is saying, there's enough soil for the seed to germinate. Like there's a few inches or so of seed to germinate, but because of how thin the soil is, the seed actually will be the first to grow because it's shallow. It will be the first to spring up and look like it's going to bear fruit. But because of how shallow the soil is and there's not enough moisture in the, in the soil, it's not deep enough. So the seed is exposed and the sun quickly burns it out and it dies. This represents the emotional hearer to God's word. The, you know, the Johns of the world that I shared about at the beginning. Someone who receives the word of God with joy, with great emotion. But the troubles of life overshadow any opportunity 
for growth. The growth is short-lived. It's shallow. It just, it doesn't last. And this is the one, I think, in Jesus' parable that always has left, left me conflicted. Because I think it's a double-edged sword. I think, yeah, there are certainly some hearts that do fall away because they're shallow. There's not enough depth. And all they want when it comes to God is the benefits, you know, the, the joy. They don't want the sorrow. They want the joy. And if there's any sorrow that comes with following, it's like, no, thank you. I didn't sign up for that. I want to live a life of happiness. I, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Do you, you want me to give money? You want me to give time? You want me to, you know, there's, there's a cost to, to following Jesus? I'm good. And they, they give it up. They walk away. But as believers, I think we need to be really careful that when it comes to spreading God's seed, that we don't try to settle for just getting an emotional response without helping them know the full cost of following Jesus. What what do I mean by that? Well, it's very normal when you and I scatter the seed of God's word that we want someone to know the benefits of God's salvation. Your life will be filled with, you know, it'll have purpose and meaning and you'll have joy. You'll have eternal life. You'll be with God. You know, your, your loved ones who know him, you'll be with them for eternity. And that's all great news, and we should certainly share in all the incredible benefits. But if the gospel is only reduced, if the seed is only scattered in terms of what God is going to give you or do for you, and it doesn't come with the reality of the seriousness of our sin, of our need for repentance, that, yeah, there's joy, but joy comes in the morning after what? Sorrow. (laughs) And that when you come to faith in Jesus Christ, you should, before you have joy, there should be a sense of sorrow in your heart. Sorrow for your sin. Sorrow for the wrongdoings, for the transgressions against God. The, The Bible says that godly sorrow produces repentance that leads to salvation. It's not joy that leads us to repentance. It's not joy that leads us to salvation. It's it's sorrow, godly sorrow, that leads us to repentance. And if it doesn't come, if the seed is not scattered with the call to take up your cross, to die to yourselves, to live a life that actually doesn't belong to you, your bank account doesn't belong to you, your family, your life, your job, you give it all over to the Lord. You lay it down also and you say it's all yours. Have with it what you want to do. Lead me, call me, do with it what you want me to do. That if it doesn't come with the true cost of following Jesus, then we are perhaps might be selling the gospel short and try, we are the ones who are ge- trying to genetically alter the seed of God's word. It's like a Beyond Meat burger. Which on the, you're like, which looks like a burger, right? If you put a Beyond Meat burger on my plate, I would look at that and I would say, that looks like a burger. But then I would bite into it and I would say, something's missing. What is it? Oh yeah, the beef. We need to be careful that we are not spreading a Beyond Gospel. And that if, when we do that, we can actually play a part in making one's soil shallow ground. Salvation that costs you nothing is not salvation. Putting your hand up at an altar call 25 years ago to absolutely do nothing with your faith for 25 years is not following Jesus. Bearing fruit, the fruit of God's word, comes through obedience to God's word sacrifice, counting it all as lost. We count it all as loss for the sake of knowing Christ, and we gladly do it because it is in dying. That is how we are born to eternal life. So the third seed then is the seed with plenty of thorny weeds. And the thorny weed was a very common weed in Palestine. And the soil in which the, there are weeds is great. There's plenty of depth for it to go down. There's no rocks. It's not compacted. But it's competing with the other weeds for nutrients. And it too dies out because it just can't outlive and outlast the company that it shares in that soil. I hate weeds. And if anyone has a good way to get rid of weeds in your lawn, just come see me after church. Let's chat. I'll pray for you. You pray for me. We'll share. I need to know how to get rid of weeds. (laughs) 
But isn't it amazing that how much you do to your lawn? Like, you aerate it, you fertilize it, you overseed it, but those weeds always grow back quicker and faster and stronger, don't they? They do. This is the heart that is in love with both God and the world. Jesus says it's the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things, which are antithetical to the gospel, and a love of the world belongs nowhere near a follower of Christ. In fact, the Bible calls this mixing of seed, this unequal yoking together of the world and God, this merging of loves in your heart, calls it actually idol- adultery. Adultery. James 4 verse 4 says, You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Like you're, when you love the world, you're, you're making yourself hostile to God. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world, you're making yourself an enemy of God. First John says, do not love the world or anything in the world. For if anyone loves the world, what? The love of the Father is not in him. Those are strong words, aren't they? <laughs> the Bible is so clear in this. God and the world cannot coexist in anyone's heart. You're either going to love one or the other. You're not going to love both. So choose. Choose. I'd rather, you know, you're either hot or you're cold. But if you're lukewarm, Revelation says, I'm just going to spit you right out of my mouth. Weeds are so invasive. This is more than just a tug of war between loves. We're talking about a cosmic battle that exists between kingdoms. Two kingdoms are at war over your heart kingdom of this world, the kingdom of Satan, and the kingdom of God. Then finally, then we, there is the seed that is sown on good soil, which produces a harvest that Jesus described as being 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. Now, what does Jesus mean by that? You know, remember, we said it before, but we, we had to avoid the temptation of trying to make every parable allegorical and that every little detail has some sort of symbolic, you know, hidden meaning. What Jesus means is that he's not being cryptic. He's not being allegorical, but rather he's emphasizing just the abundance of God's harvest in the heart. It's, it's going to be massive. It's 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. Like just, it's beyond anything you've ever, beyond your wildest dreams. That's how big the harvest of God's word is going to be when it is met with good soil. And the good soil is the heart that, repre- that hears God's word. So you hear it, but then you accept it as God's truth, and then also you then allow God's word to accomplish its results in your life. You bear fruit, so to speak. And as a result of your obedience, your receptivity to the truth of God's word, the seed of God's power begins to grow in your hearts, and it grows and it grows, and it will produce a harvest of righteousness that is just beyond your wildest dreams. Does anyone here have ears to hear what Jesus is saying this morning? Do you hear it? Do you hear what he's calling you? What does Jesus want us to hear? Honestly, I think that there are about 20 messages in this one passage alone. So starting next week, we're going to start a 20-week series on Mark chapter 4. No, that would be hilarious. But what I want to do is just break down this parable to really just the one point. I think if there's one point that Jesus wants to make, this is what Jesus wants us to hear. And that is, bear fruit. God wants you and I to bear good fruit. And I think this parable serves as a challenge to every believer here in this room to bear fruit with the seed of God's word. It's almost like Jesus is challenging his disciples that if you just tend to, if you just care for, if you just nourish and watch over the condition of your heart, if you just sort of be the soil that is receptive to God's word, just watch what I can do. Watch and see that I can produce a harvest of righteousness with your life that is going to just blow your minds. How do we bear fruit? Matthew chapter 3 verse 8 says, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Repentance is the first place where God begins to till the soil of our hearts. 
Because we aren't born as good soil. You know, right? We, we aren't just born and we're just the, the, the lucky 25% who just was born with good soil and those other 75% just aren't as blessed as we are. We're the lucky ones. We're the favored ones. We're the chosen ones. No, no, no. We're all born into this world as sinners. And how God breaks down whether you're the hardened heart or the thorny heart or the rocky heart is through repentance. Repentance is where the tilling happens in the soil that God's word gets sown into our hearts and it is also sows to produce but it also tills up our hearts. You know David says in the book of Psalms, search me O God and know my heart. Try me and see if there's anything in me and that is grievous to you. See if there's any be any grievous way in me. He's saying, God, I'm an open book. Search me and know me. When was the last time you prayed that prayer? I encourage you, pray that prayer this week. God, I give you permission to search my heart. And if there's anything in it you don't like, you can let me know. Whew. How does God search our hearts? How does he, has he search you and know you? Through his word. That's why you got to read the word. Because as we read the word, Hebrew says that the living word of God, it, it has this ability to penetrate our soul and our spirit. Judging, it judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. So why do you read God's word? Just you get to know it? No, no, no. When you read it, you, the word of God gets to know you. <laughs> we, we've got it backwards. Like, I'm just getting to know the word of God. No, no, let God's word get to know you. Let it discern your heart and judge your thoughts. I wonder if that's one of the reasons why we often keep our Bibles on our shelves because we don't want to be judged. We don't want our thoughts and our actions to be discerned or known. But from there, we hear it. We understand it. We apply it to our lives through obedience. And we, ac we actually do what it says. Like, think of that. Isn't that amazing? We actually do what the Bible says. And we let our lives and our families and our jobs and our everything be guided by God's word. And God's, you know, by God, God's word says. And as a result, fruitfulness will come from your faithfulness. Remember I said at the beginning, it's not our job to measure fruitfulness, but to measure faithfulness. But the great news today is that when we heed to faithfulness, God will Bring fruit. Fruitfulness will result from your faithfulness. I promise you that. It may not be today. You know, if the God's word is being sown into your heart, it might not be today. It might not be tomorrow. You may be waiting and hoping. Keep waiting. Keep hoping. Trust the seed of God's word. Trust that as you dig into God's word, as you hear God's word, that it's going to bring about the result that, that it's intended to do. Remember, there's no problem with the seed. The seed is perfect. It's right here that matters. So Jesus wants you to bear fruit. And that's why he shared this parable with you. And yes, it's a challenge, but more than that, it should be received today as an encouragement. Be encouraged today. Be encouraged by this parable. Because I don't know about you, but for so long I read this parable and I was discouraged by reading it. I was discouraged to think that at any time there are 75% of people out there who are saying no because of what's in their hearts, that three-fourths of people are, are rejecting, you know, the good news of Jesus. You know, if you take on the role of sower, you will experience failure. Jesus said, if you, if the world ends up hating you, just can you keep in mind that it first hated me? I just want you to be encouraged by that, Jesus says. Just be encouraged that if they hate you, want to throw rocks at you, and they want to cancel you, they canceled me first. It's not personal. <laughs> it's not you, it's me that they hate. But today, don't let the three soils, the hard soil, the rocky soil, the thorny soil, overshadow the incredibly good news of the one good soil, of what God has done in the hearts of the good soil, of what God is doing, and what will God will do with the very few who say yes to him. You see, for those who say yes to him today, and if you have not said yes to him before, I encourage you today, make it today. Do, don't wait. Don't hesitate. Say yes. When, your, when God transforms your heart, he transforms it into the good soil. When that seed meets good soil, it's going to produce in your life a wonderful harvest of righteousness. 
If you dedicate your life, this is for you, church, Christians who have been following Jesus for a long time. If you, and, and like we, we sang that today, Holy Spirit, renew your strength in me. Maybe today that's your prayer. God, I've, 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 I've set out on this path to being good soil, but slowly there's been a drift and I've allowed the soil of my heart. Perhaps I haven't attended to weeding. I haven't, you know, been repenting of my sin. I've allowed weeds to grow in the soil or perhaps, you know, rocks have sort of found its place or it's been compacted by foot traffic. I've become calloused and bitter by, by whatever it is today. If you today just dedicate your life or just ask God, renew in me, a, create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit in me today. I Trust me today, you can take this to the bank and if you need a, a guarantee with a 100% refund, if this does not happen, you come see me later on in life. Meet me in heaven. I'll refund you. I'll give you some of the treasure out of my, out of my own treasure chest if I get any treasure. God is going to produce in your life a wonderful harvest. So take heart today. Repent. Bear fruit in, in keeping with repentance. Be obedient to God's word. Get right back into God's word and just like God, renew a heart in me for your word. I've gotten lazy. I've gotten apathetic. Maybe I've gotten a little bit hardened. But today, Lord, I'm coming back. As we sang today, I'm coming back to the heart of worship. I'm coming back because Lord, your arms are always open to me. Your door's always open. You know, they say you overestimate what you'll accomplish in a year, but you always like, underestimate what you accomplish in five, ten years. It's kind of a cool, cool phrase. Imagine what God is going to do with a lifetime of your faithfulness. Imagine what God will do with a, of being good soil. So what does Jesus want your heart to be today? Encouraged. Encouraged. Encouraged to keep going. Be attentive. Be watchful. Be quick to repent quick to forgive, quick to endure, which is like an oxymoron. You can't be quick to endure because it's like you endure, but you can't be quick. Says. And finally today, I'll just close with this. Just because I want to leave you today encouraged. Do you remember John at the beginning of our story who came to faith in Christ hot, but then it quickly fizzled out and didn't see him again for years? Do you want to know where John is today? He's serving the Lord faithfully. He's serving the Lord faithfully. He came back. He came back. He renewed his heart to the Lord. He repented, and he's still serving the Lord faithfully today. Because no matter what soil you find yourself in today, maybe today you're sitting there and you're like, oh my gosh, soil of my heart's not good. It doesn't matter today what soil is in your hearts. God is the God of miracles. He's the great gardener of your heart, of your soul. Perhaps today he wants us to do a new work in you today. He wants to break up that fallow ground. He wants to weed the weeds of worldliness. He wants to do a new work in you and call you to greater things and you, where you learn to remain steadfast and endure through persecution and tribulation. The amazing thing is when you endure, you realize God has been with me and the more you endure through tribulation, the more untouchable you become by Satan. I, I swear, there, there are some people who have been through so much there's so much peace in their hearts. You know, they've endured cancer or this or that. You know, it's just like God, they're like, I still love the Lord. I love the Lord so much. There's such a peace in their heart. And you look at them, you're like, man, Satan doesn't stand a chance. <laughs> but it didn't start that way, right? They had to endure. They had to persevere. So let's stand to our, our feet. And let's just, let's just pray by, together, let's just respond in prayer by just uh, asking these two questions. Lord, search me and know me and examine the condition of my heart. Lord, what is the soil you find my heart in today? Would you, honestly, would you, would you pray that prayer? Like, don't just let me just say that hypothetically. Like, pray that prayer, Lord. Do you search me and know me today? Lord, I know you, you sometimes discipline, you discipline us because you love us, Lord, and you will call out the junk, the sin, not because you want to just, you know, lambaste us, Lord, but you want to bring us back to you. 
You want to purify us and refine us. You want to make us the good soil. So Lord, today, if we hear your voice today, let us not harden our hearts. Let us hear your voice today. And then number two, we'll close this. Who are those in your life that you are praying, that you want to pray for? That you realize that they are one of the soils that is not receiving the word with is not producing a harvest today. Would you just bring that name before the Lord? And let's just take this opportunity just to pray for them once again. Just to lift up their name to the Lord. And even say their names right now, just in your heart or aloud or whoever you want. So let's pray. Lord, today we are both challenged and encouraged by your word. In fact, I say, Lord, every single parable, I've been encouraged and challenged. And Lord, the challenge today, Lord, is to bear fruit with our lives. And Lord, we want to, you know, we want to give an account today. When we stand before you, we want to give an account of our obedience. To be able to show you what we did with what you provided us. To to show you faithfulness. To show you endurance. To show you great love. And Lord, in order to do that, Lord, we need to be the good soil today that receives the implanted word of God And Lord, in order to do that, Lord, we begin just by repenting today. If there's anything in us today that you find grievous, you find find is not right in us, we repent of it. We say we're sorry, Lord. And we ask you just your word to come and just till up that, that, that ground. Make us good soil, Lord. Help us to remain steadfast to be in good soil, to take up our cross and to follow you. And Lord, also today we lift up the names of those who have fallen away, who have maybe were like the, who have started hot, but then they walked away. Who maybe who are hardened by life, by maybe they've been hurt by the church or by a, a spiritual leader in their life who has wounded them. And as a result, it's been, the ground's been compacted today. And they need healing and they just need your, a fresh touch today of, of, your, of you today. Or maybe there's a worldliness today in them. We just ask today, Lord, that, Lord, for you to uh, do a work in their hearts, Lord. And if you could use us to be sowers, Lord, help us not to judge the hearts of sinners, but just to be faithful, to scatter seed where we are called to scatter. Lord, if you call us to scatter seed today on the hearts of those who are hardened or, or weed or weedy or whatever, Lord, just help us to be faithful to do so, to scatter those seed of God's word. Trusting, Lord, that you you are in control, Lord, of, of what happens after. We're in control, Lord, of what we do with the seed that's in our hands. Lord, so we, we release it to you, Lord, and we, we will sow faithfully today. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.